He had a look of fear on his face. It's nothing I'd seen before. Did you say anything when you saw this? What did you do? We were struggling. We were trying to keep him from driving away. It just, it just went chaotic. I, it... Shortly after former Brooklyn Center police officer Kim Potter took the stand, her defense team rested their case. Closing arguments are now set to begin tomorrow morning. And joining us this morning with expert analysis, Marsh Hallberg, who is a criminal defense attorney not associated with the case, but like many of us, has been watching it very closely. Good morning, Marsh. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. So, so much to unpack from Potter's testimony on Friday. Let's start with that moment that we just replayed where Potter said she saw the fear in her fellow officer's face as he was in the passenger side of Dante Wright's vehicle. Your thought about that part of the testimony? Well, I thought it was extremely powerful. That moment uh, really kind of humanized her, uh, brought her out. I thought she kind of started very stiff, which is not, not that uncommon for people to do in the stand. They are scared. They're uncomfortable. So she has started out pretty uh, rigid, but after that, she, she came through strongly with that testimony. Um, I think it, it put her in a position where you understood what the chaos was, and she used the word chaotic in that moment. So I think it was, it was smart to put her on last. I think generally defense attorneys will tell you that despite juries being told that defendants have the right to remain silent, uh, that they still really like to have defendants get on the stand, look them in the eye and say, I didn't do it or I didn't mean to do it. So I think it was essential that uh, she did testify here. And in, talking about her, her, how she was conducting herself when she first got on the stand, is that why they kind of start off with questions about her background and her education and things just to kind of set a baseline and kind of get her comfortable? Yeah. Especially for your own witnesses, you'll do that. You'll kind of want to warm them up like anything, right? And so they just get it going with the, with the softballs to get it going. Sometimes if you're doing the cross-examination, you come up with some of your hardest questions first to try to catch the other side off guard. Obviously a very emotional uh, moments throughout the trial, but especially while she was on the stand breaking down at one point, she apologized and also said she would have never pulled over Wright's car in the first place. How much weight and how much significant do you see in that? Those are really good points to make. I think there's a, there's a, you know, a racial profiling kind of a current out there that everyone's concerned about in cases. And I think the point that people are worried about pretext stops, that we don't want somebody to die because they have an air freshener on their rearview mirror. So I think the fact that she could say, look, I was only the training officer here. It was totally the discretion of the officer Lucky who was driving the car to decide whether to stop or not. I think that helped explain that she wasn't the one that made that call. Um, and, I, and I think the fact that she apologizes and goes that she's so human. The defense did a very good job of bringing on witnesses before her to talk about who she was, even through the state's witnesses. Uh, they were able to bring out what a good person she was, all the volunteer things she's involved with. And you put that together then with her getting on and, and talking about this and saying, I'm sorry, which is a way of saying, I didn't intend to do this. Recklessness is an intentional crime. I intend to recklessly act on something. So that was a kind of a, a layman's term way of her of, of pushing back on that state's theory. Overall, how she conducted herself on the stand when this was kind of the moment that a lot of people on both sides were waiting for. Do you think overall it was uh, a strong moment for the defense to, to have her on there? Overall, do you think she did well? I think she did well. I think she could have done better. And that's, I think, everybody's been, been talking about this in the last day or so, kind of wonders about that. You, you showed the clip about Sergeant Johnson, the officer at the side, and, and the fear she saw in his face. But what you didn't hear after that was any follow-up questions by the defense about, okay, what did that cause? What were you thinking then? And I was waiting for questions at that point about, well, I thought he could die. I was, I, in the moment, I had to make a snap decision. And so maybe that was a defense tactic to leave those questions out, and they'll argue that in closing statements. But I think the jury would have liked a little bit more to know what was going on in her head at that point. Talk about the preparations, whether it's, you know, likely for Potter or for anyone taking the stand in their own defense. Talk about the preparations that go into preparing for someone for their, you know, their life future on the line there. What the preparations are that go into that, both for their, their attorney team and for them personally. 
like everything in life, right? Practice, practice, practice makes you better. Yeah. And so that's what you do with your witnesses when you're a lawyer. You bring your clients in, you sit them down, and you practice with them. In our law firm, we'll bring other attorneys into the uh, meeting room, and they will act as the prosecutors and try to be very aggressive and ask all the really tough questions. You want to teach your witnesses to not fight over the things they can't win. So concede the points, like the taser and the gun look different. They are different weights. They're in different positions on your holster, on your belt. All those kinds of things. Practice giving those up. I think that uh, Sergeant Potter, excuse me, Officer Potter was a little too argumentative uh, on those points with the state a little bit, but she did a, a fairly good job. But you practice all those things. Body position, speaking slowly, looking at the jury, your demeanor. And you practice the really hard questions and how you answer it. And if you don't, they don't answer it well, you do it again. If they don't answer it well, you do it again. And now, of course, as Potter was the last person to take the stand, the jury left with the weekend to process what they heard. Um, what are your thoughts just about the timing and the style overall of how the attorneys on both sides have moved through this and, and kind of, you know, how things have now ended? Some of a trial is just luck, right? When a case happens to end, because you can never coordinate that through all the days of trial. Couldn't have been better for the defense. Like for all of us, we remember those interactions in our life that happened most recently. So Potter testified last. So on Friday, that's the last thing the jury heard. They have all weekend to think about her crying and her being a good person. And that holds with all of them. Frankly, what do we really remember about early in the week? We know there was a bunch of policy manuals and training that said, you know, obviously be careful and don't shoot somebody. But we kind of all knew that already anyway. Um, frankly, I thought the state overtried their case. Uh, they called dozens of witnesses. They had over an hour long opening statement. And I thought they just burrowed down too far into all the minutia of policies and procedures. We know that she was trained not to do this. Uh, on the def on, by contrast, the defense, I thought, had a very crisp, sharp uh, defense they put in. Very few witnesses, conversational tone, and it just, I think, it was more relatable for a jury to hear it that way. And for Potter herself, were you surprised at all at the length of time, relatively short, I guess, in a lot of opinions, yeah. but the amount of time she spent on the stand? I think some people expected her to be on the stand all day Friday. Yeah, I sure did. I thought there's going to be a lot more questioning by both sides. I thought, but I think part of it is what we didn't know until the trial came up was I want to know what questions are going to be asked for. Why did you say you thought you were going to go to prison, for example? Those kinds of statements she made on the video, her answer to all of that was she doesn't recall any of that. She just kind of blacked out until she got back to the, to the station. So that was her answer to all those things. But I was wondering how what her answers were going to be those types of things. So that shortened it up quite a bit. All right. And uh, again, a lot to listen for tomorrow with uh, the closing argument. So criminal defense attorney Marsh Hallberg, we appreciate your time. Happy holidays to you. You too. Thank you. Thank and you. again, Fax 9 is airing our gavel to gavel coverage of the Kim Potter trial that will continue with closing arguments streaming both on Fox9.com and through our YouTube page.